Welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free, formerly Wannabe Minimalist, the podcast for busy families who are tired of the chaos, fed up with being overwhelmed, and ready to enjoy life again. Each week, we talk about how to let go of the clutter so that you can focus on the things that actually matter. And it's not just physical clutter. We talk about the mental and emotional stuff too, because if it's holding you back, it's time to ditch it. I share what I've done in my own life to declutter, organize, and calm the chaos, but you won't just hear it from me. There are amazing guests too. It's practical, doable, and simple for those of us that want to be clutter-free. Well, hey there, my friend. Welcome back to the show. My name is Deanna Yates, and you are listening to episode 203 of the Want to Be Clutter-Free podcast. On today's episode, I'm breaking down a concept called the emotional cycle of change in order to help you declutter more effectively. And it won't just help you declutter, it is also going to help you in any area of your life where you are trying to make a change or do something differently. Anytime you create a goals list, you're trying something different, and this is really going to help with that. Because if you have ever started a new project with lots of excitement, I'm raising my hand over here, and then quickly lost that momentum, well, this episode is for you. I'm going to talk about why that happens and what we can do to overcome it. But before we get into that, I do want to start with a quick thank you to you for joining me on this show today. I really hope you come away from this episode feeling inspired and encouraged and motivated to reach your decluttering goal today. If you like what you hear, I encourage you to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And as always, I so appreciate when you share this show with others. It's one of the best ways for me to help others out. And I also want to invite you to join me over on Instagram. I am at wannabe clutter free over there. And I have been sharing lots more tips about calming the chaos with simple tips that work for moms. My favorite new series over there are my one minute clutter free hacks. So check it out and let me know your favorite one so far. And if you want even more community and connection on your decluttering journey, I encourage you to check out our private community on Facebook. It's the wannabe minimalist family group over there, and it is totally free to join. So come on over and join in that conversation if you want to. And just a quick reminder, you can get detailed show notes for this episode and all of the episodes by going over to wannabeclutterfree.com slash 202 for this specific episode. That's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 202. And so with that, let's get into it and take a look at the emotional cycle of change and how knowing about it can help you get through the hard parts of making changes in your life. So I came across this idea while reading The 12-Week Year by Brian Morgan and Michael Lennington. And while that book is all about productivity and business and basically reaching your professional goals, this concept of embracing change made so much sense for how I see the decluttering process working out. So anytime we want to do something new, we're making a change. And change is uncomfortable, right? We are creatures of habit as humans. And so anytime we do something a little bit different, there's going to be some pushback. And that's why it's so helpful to understand the process that we actually go through. Because whenever we decide to make a change in our life, we experience an emotional roller coaster. So I've recently said on this show that the items that are on your goals list or like your resolutions, things you want to accomplish, those are generally scary. They're hard. They're uncomfortable. And it is this emotional cycle of change that can really help us understand why that is. Like if we understand the, this emotional cycle behind it, we can then understand why it's hard and we can move past it. So things on our goal list, well, they're hard because they're things we're not doing now. If it was easy if it was comfortable, we would already be doing these things. But psychologists Don Kelly and Daryl Connor described this phenomenon way back in the mid-1970s in a paper called The Emotional Cycle of Change. Shocker, same name. It includes five stages of this emotional experience. And so today we're going to talk about examples and of how each of these stages align with the decluttering process, but it's not just with decluttering and it's not just with professional goals. You should know that no matter what change you choose to make in your life, you will experience this cycle. It could be a new job. It could be a new house. It could be new hobbies. It could be new purchases, whatever. Good changes, bad changes, doesn't matter. It's always the same. Now, these stages might be short. They might be long. The emotions might be high. They might be low. They might be really intense. They might be really mild. It's generally going to depend on how big the change is, but this cycle repeats itself. 
So let's get into it and find out how we can make change easier in our own lives. All right, so there are five stages of the ECOC, that's the emotional cycle of change, and they are number one, uninformed optimism, number two, informed pessimism, number three, the valley of despair, number four, informed optimism, and number five, completion. And it looks like a quadrant. So if you had a plus sign um, on your page, that horizontal line is basically neutral. And so if you are looking at neutral and then above the neutral line is a positive emotion and below the neutral line is a negative emotion, basically this kind of looks like a big bucket, like an upside down bell curve. So you're going to start positive and you're, I don't know what side I'm supposed to be on if you're watching this on YouTube. So you're going to start positive and then it kind of dips into the negative and then at the end it comes back up on the positive if you can make it all the way to completion. So I just want you to kind of have an idea about how that looks and how it works out on paper. So let's take a closer look at each one so you can understand what each stage means. So stage number one, uninformed optimism. I also like to call this the stage of excitement. The first stage of change is usually the most exciting, and that's why it's called the stage of excitement. It's when you think about all the good things and the positive outcomes that will happen when you make this change. You're not thinking about the process of making the change. You're thinking about the end goal, and you are all excited. You have this idea. You don't see any problems yet. We're optimistic because we only see the positive aspects of the change, and we lack a full understanding of the challenges ahead. This stage is super fun. It's my favorite stage and it's most people's favorite. Actually, completion is the best one, but this stage is super fun. It's exciting and it's just invigorating and you're just so pumped up. And this is the dream stage. This is when you're just kind of thinking about all the good things that can happen and why you want to make that change and what's going to happen and the good things that are going to happen when you make that change. It's super fun because we're coming up with lots of ideas and we're making plans for how we can make things better. This first stage is before you even take a step forward, even a tiny, tiny step forward. This is just the idea and excitement stage. And so as soon as you start to take a step, we actually move into stage two, and that's when we start to lose a little bit of excitement. We're going to get there in just a second. But stage one is just this moment, right? This this idea of, of what it, life is going to be like when you get on the other side of the change. All right, so let's take a quick break while we're on this high to hear from this week's sponsor. And when we come back, we'll get into steps two through five. Do you ever find yourself staring into your closet feeling like you've got tons of clothes but nothing to wear? Well, I've discovered a fabulous solution that's perfect for us busy women. Armoire. Armoire offers high-quality, unique brands tailored just for you. All it takes is a quick five-minute style quiz and voila, you get a personalized closet from which to choose. The best part? These stylish outfits are delivered straight to your door in just a couple of days. I just returned from a podcast conference and Armoire saved the day when it came down to what to wear. I wore these super cute wide leg jeans from Paige to the day portion of the conference and that night I wore cropped wide leg vegan leather pants and an asymmetrical striped sweater. I got compliments all night and had people mentioning my outfit the next day. Then I was able to simply send it back for something new. No clutter, no fuss, no special laundry. And it's not just about looking good, it's about feeling good too. Armoire is all about sustainable fashion, so you can stay trendy without the waste. Plus, it's women-founded and led, supporting women designers and aligning perfectly with our values of empowerment and community. Right now, my listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash wanna. That's armoire.style, A-R-M-O-I-R-E, dot style slash wanna to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armoire today. Hey everyone, today I want to talk to you about something that's helping me show up as my best self, hormone harmony. For any woman navigating the ups and downs of hormonal change, whether you're in your 20s or past 40, this is something you'll want to hear about. I started taking Hormone Harmony because lately I've been feeling off balance, you know? I was snacking more, feeling sluggish, and just not like myself. I was pretty flat. And that's when I found Hormone Harmony. It's been a game changer. It's not only for those of us that might be hitting perimenopause, but for any woman who feels like their hormones could be more in sync. 
Did you know a bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds? Yep, it's that popular. And it's not hard to see why. This wonderful supplement is packed with adaptogens. These are science-backed herbal extracts that help your body adapt to stress and minimize those annoying hormonal fluctuations. So whether it's hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, or just feeling perpetually tired, Hormone Harmony addresses all of these symptoms gently and effectively. And for those navigating the tricky waters of perimenopause, it is nothing short of a lifesaver. The company behind Hormone Harmony, Happy Mammoth, is all about making women's health simpler and safer. Their products are sugar-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, non-GMO, and third-party tested to ensure the highest quality. And the best part? Women are reporting they feel like themselves again. If you're ready to start feeling like yourself again, I've got great news. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code WANA at checkout. That's happymammoth.com with the code WANA, W-A-N-N-A, for 15% off your first order. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. All right, welcome back. Let's continue with the remaining stages of the emotional cycle of change. Number two is informed pessimism. This is the stage of realization. It is the second stage and things are starting to get tough. You've taken that first tiny step or big step, doesn't matter, but you start to feel a little pushback, start to feel a little resistance. Things didn't just unfold and you didn't suddenly go from never doing this thing to being perfect at this thing. You kind of thought things might be beautiful and wonderful right away and that's just not how life works. So that excited optimism is fading as reality sets in and you start to notice the problems or the costs. Everything in life is going to come with a cost or a trade-off. So you might start to wonder if making this change is really worth it. Is it going to be worth all the hard work, all of the time, all the effort, all the energy that you're going to need to put in in order to get to the other side, in order to implement this change? You might even think about giving up, but you don't at this point yet. And the thing is, this isn't actually even the worst stage yet. This isn't as bad as you're going to feel. And I know I'm giggling as I say that, but it's true, right? Just when you think it can't get tougher, it actually does. And we head into stage three. So stage three is called the valley of despair. And this is the stage of lowest morale. It is when people feel like giving up. And in fact, it's when most people do give up because at this point, change is hard. So stage one, super excited. You only saw the good things about the change. And then this stage is the farthest away from that stage you are going to get, right? That stage, even if it were ju- was just yesterday or the day before, or even a few minutes ago, depending on the change you're actually making, you might get to this valley of despair pretty quickly. Even if it wasn't that long ago, it is going to feel a world away because right now all you are seeing is bad. You are just in the thick of it. You are in the muck and it is no fun. You're tired. You're uncomfortable. You just went out of this situation. And in order to do that, you could either keep moving forward, but you're not sure how long that's going to take. Or you might realize that, hey, you know what? If I just gave up and I just went back to the old way of doing things, I could stop feeling this way. And that is why a lot of people quit. This is when most people quit. And that is why a lot of people don't reach their goals. So I want to tell you about this so that you can be someone who actually does reach your goals because you might start to think like you're going to start to rationalize. You're going to start to say like, eh, maybe it wasn't so bad before. You know, I was living okay. It was okay. It wasn't great. But you start to make up excuses and, you know, you just, you're just like so uncomfortable right now. You don't want to keep doing it. And so your mind is going to tell you any, it's going to give you any excuse to go back to where you at least were comfortable, even if you weren't happy. But you wanted to make this change for some reason. So when things get tough, when the rubber hits the road, what are you going to do? I want you to keep going. When it is hard, you need a strong vision. You need a strong, compelling, exciting stage one so you can push through this valley of despair. And that is going to help you pull out of it. So I want you to think about a time when I'm going to give you an example here, just because I know as I'm saying all this stuff, you're like, why would anyone do this? Well, we would do it and you probably have. So think about a time where you have reached a goal, right? You've had a goal. It was hard, but you worked for it and you really wanted it. It was because what you wanted was worth it. 
So I'm going to use an example just because we're women here and I'm sure lots of women have done this and maybe this isn't a great example, but I'm not doing our house just yet. We're going to get into cluttering in a minute, but Let's say you wanted to lose five pounds, and so you stopped eating bread for breakfast, and you switched to a more nutritional breakfast like overnight oats or green smoothies or something like that instead of just having a piece of toast. And that first day was fine. So stage one for you was this idea of when I lose five pounds, I will, my pants will fit better, I will be happier, blah, 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 these kinds of things, right? I'm going to feel better, I'm going to be more confident, and um, the reasons why we think we need to lose weight, whether they are true or not. Um, But anyway, so that is stage one, just this idea of what it's going to be like on the other side. Stage two is that first day where you you switch out what you're eating. And it's not so bad because you're still excited. You know, you're not too far below that neutral line. And, you know, it's not the best, but it's okay. But by day two or day five, you're really in it. Like you're in the valley of despair. You're in the thick of it. You are over it. You don't like the foods you're eating, you know, all those kind of things. So maybe you just need to make a couple switches. Let's not go back to the old habits that got us to where we were. We want to figure out a sustainable solution. And so maybe you decide you like green smoothies, but you don't like overnight oats. Okay, we'll stop the overnight oats. Try the green smoothie. Try something else that's you know, a different option so you can keep moving forward, right? So right there in the middle of it, when you're just like, oh, I just want to give up, that's the value of despair, but we got to work through it. So we are going to do that in steps four and five. Okay, so stage four is informed optimism. So after working through those tough times in the previous stage, you start to see the results of your hard work and all that effort that you're putting in, you're starting to see the benefits. You get better at what you're doing, so you start to feel more comfortable because you've overcome some challenges and you've proven to yourself that you can do it. You can do hard things so you continue on that path. And then as you continue, you overcome more and more challenges and now you are more likely to succeed. You're back to feeling positive. So we went from below the neutral line on our grid to the positive side above the neutral line and we are positive again. You're starting to feel happy. You're starting to see those benefits. You're realizing the efforts of what you've done and you've moved past the hard parts, the hardest parts of making that change. And so it doesn't seem so bad anymore, right? We can always look back with rose-colored glasses. You've overcome them. Your new ways of thinking and acting are starting to feel more normal. You're kind of getting into these new habits and a new routine. And so the important thing at this point is just that you keep going. So you get to stage four and you're like, oh, this is starting to feel good. Well, you have to at this point just tell yourself to keep going because if you don't, you're not going to get to the fifth and final stage, which is called success and fulfillment or completion. This is where you have mastery and satisfaction and you're hitting those goals. So in this stage, you feel super proud because you've accomplished what you set out to do. And the things that you do, they just start to become second nature. So if we're talking about uh, our breakfast swaps, right? Now you've found things that work for you and you're happy with it. And you don't miss the toast anymore because you've found alternatives that are just as tasty and more nutritious for you. And so these habits start to compound upon themselves and you really solidify the new change. And so you're on the other side of uh, the valley of despair. (laughs) And so each time you go through these stages and reach this point, you not only get better at what you're doing, but you start to feel more confident. So those are the five stages of the emotional cycle of change. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to show you how this emotional cycle of change works in our homes and how we can use it when we are decluttering. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell?, laughing in the face of motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. (laughs) Well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? 
And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. Okay, so we're going to walk through those five stages again, and then each time I'm going to talk about how it relates to decluttering. So stage one, back into uninformed optimism, the stage of excitement. This is where you have decided that you are going to live in a clean, clutter-free house, and you're just really excited, and you see all the possibilities ahead of you, and you think, when my house is clutter-free, I'm going to entertain more, we're going to have impromptu play dates, I'm not going to have to clean as much, there's all these positive benefits, right? I'm going to feel happier, my home's going to feel calmer, it's going to be more peaceful, I'm going to enjoy spending time here, I'm going to wake up refreshed, all of the good things, right? All of the good, all good in stage one. And so the way we can actually work this stage to our benefit, the thing we need to do when we are feeling this excitement is to write it down, really nail down that vision about why decluttering is so important to you. Because when things get tough, as we already know they're going to because we're making a change, we can refer back to this first stage of excitement and we can look at why we were so excited about it and why it's so important for us to have a clutter-free house. You know, maybe there's uh, health and safety hazards, right? If you have too many things in your home, maybe your kids aren't playing by themselves and it's just really hard and you want them to have more autonomy and you want them to be able to play on their own. Or maybe you have family that's living with you that there's fall hazards because you have piles everywhere and so you really need to clean up so that it's a safe environment for everybody that's there. Maybe it is more about entertaining and you just really want to connect with the friends in your life and no one else is doing the inviting. So you want to be that house, the gathering space for everybody. Whatever your vision is, write it down. Get really clear on it. Think about it. Like just close your eyes and visualize what it would be like and really, really, really get clear on why it's so important to you. It will make a huge difference as you go through the next steps. It's going to make stage three, that valley of despair, a lot shorter. Okay, so that's stage one and how it works with decluttering. Stage two, this informed pessimism, the stage of realization. This is when we have our first declutter session, right? If you have never decluttered before and you're starting to declutter and you get that first box out and you're kind of excited when you first start, you're like, ha. It's going to be so great. I can't wait to get rid of all this stuff. And you open your first box and you go, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to do with all this stuff. Oh my gosh, where did all this stuff come from? Oh my gosh, why am I holding on to this? Did you just hear the change in my voice? That guilt, right? That was guilt written and shame written. And we don't need to look at our stuff like that. We can take this moment and say, huh, wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. You know what? It's taken me decades to gather all of this stuff together, I'm going to just take my time and go through it. Not too long. I'm going to be methodical about it, but I also am going to understand that I'm not doing this in a weekend and we're going to lay out a plan so I can do these things in an effective manner and not really spin my wheels. Because when I first started decluttering, I would declutter a little bit in this room. I would declutter a little bit in that room. And that started to get overwhelming because I never really felt like I completed a place. I never completed one whole room or one whole space and nothing ever felt together. It kind of always just felt like I was just moving things around. And so that's why if you can create a plan, it's going to help you on the second stage, the stage of realization. And you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do for one week, I'm going to concentrate in the kitchen. And one week I'm going to concentrate in our bedroom. And one week I'm going to concentrate in our entryway. One week I'm going to concentrate in the kids' room. One week I'm going to concentrate in the living room and dining room. Those can kind of generally go together. You don't have a lot of things in there. Another week I'm going to concentrate on our linen closet. Then I'm going to do our game closet. Then I'm going to do our car. Then I'm going to do our garage. Like Just break it down into different areas and that's going to make it so much easier to really start to make headway. And another thing that's going to really help here is reaching out for support. 
So if you don't have a friend that you can bring along on this journey, come on over to our Facebook group and join in there because it's a great place to connect with others that are on this decluttering journey, ask your questions, get some feedback. And just if you have hard things that you're really struggling to let go of, just putting it out to that group can has been really helpful for a lot of the people in that group. And um, so you know you're not alone. There's other people on this journey with you. Okay, so that's stage two, the stage of realization where you got to make your plan. Make your plan so that as you're having a hard time with some things, you know that at least you're making progress and you won't fall back into the giving up section. (laughs) All right, so stage number three, the valley of despair, the lowest morale you're going to be at. If you were one of those people that used to just declutter here and there and everywhere, or you would shift your stuff around, you would, you know, kind of go through one area and have a maybe box and move that around your home, this valley of despair can get really real. Or if you have the guest room where everything goes to die, or your garage is just that place where you just continue to pile boxes and you're not really sure what's in there, this is your valley of despair place. It is the most challenging room. It's the most challenging stage. It's where people abandon their quest for change. That's This is where they do it, right? This is where people get stuck. They feel stuck and they quit. We are not going to do that. You are not going to start with your hardest things when you're decluttering. So leave the sentimental things to the end. Leave your pictures to the end. Leave you know your childhood toys or things that were really sentimental to you to later. We're going to start with our own things. We're going to start and build up our decluttering muscles with the easy things. Kitchens generally don't tend to be too hard. Entryways, if you look at them from a purpose perspective, that makes it much easier. I just did a reel about not starting in our garage. This is kind of why. Like It is where there is just so much stuff. There's other people's stuff. There's delayed decisions. Your garage is kind of where things go to die. And I think that's why people want to start there because they're like, well, I've already gotten it out, gotten it out of my house, but there is just so much and it's not helping you on a regular basis on a daily basis in your house, right? Like if you're struggling to get out of the house in the morning, we'll start in your entryway because once you get that organized, it's going to make your mornings so much less stressful. So start there, right? Or create this plan and figure out where it's going to work, like where decluttering is going to have the biggest impact on your life. So another thing I like to do that helps with this, if I'm struggling to know where to start, is to give every space a purpose. So if our entryway's purpose is a place to hold our belongings when we come in at the end of the day and a place for us to easily get outside of the house with all the things we need to make our day successful, it's a little bit easier to know what to keep in that space, right? We don't need to keep board games here. We don't need to keep our silverware here. We don't need to keep extra bedding here, right? If this is a place where we need to have the things that make it easy for us to get out of the house and be ready for our day and to be successful in our day, what does that mean? Likely it's shoes, coats, keys, bags, uh, homework folders, things like that, right? Umbrellas, sunglasses, sunblock, the things that you need to get out of the house in the morning. Um, I even toyed one time with keeping our socks here because my socks there, because it was the one thing I would always forget. I would always be in my house barefoot and then I would forget to get the socks. Um, In this new house, it's a little bit different. But when we had two stories, I actually kept my socks in the entryway because I hated having to go up a flight and a half of stairs to get the socks that I would always forget because I never put them on in the morning when I got dressed. So what you keep in these areas is personalized for you and your family, but it might be something crazy like that. But if you have a purpose and you know what each space is used for, it's easier for you to know what to keep there. All right, so that's the value of despair. You got to keep going, but if we start with the easier things, it's going to be much easier to move through it and you will be stronger when you get to the harder decluttering items. Stage number four is informed optimism. This is when you start to make progress in one of the areas in your home. So let's say you've done a quick 15 minute declutter and you're like, okay, and I got it done. And you put all the stuff away and you come back and the space feels good. You have one area in your home that's decluttered and you feel so great about it. Well, that 
my friend, is informed optimism. You have conquered a challenge and you feel wonderful. You're starting to see the benefits. You overcame the obstacles. You did one section, one space. Okay? So that's it. Really, that's how it works when you're decluttering. And so you just have to continue this momentum. You have to maintain it, tackle another small section of the project, right? Do one more 15-minute declutter tomorrow, right? Do one a day if you can. Do maybe three a week if daily is too hard for you. But if you have regular, quick decluttering sessions, it's going to make a huge difference in your house. You're going to start to see progress. You're going to want to keep doing it. And then you've moved through that valley of despair and you start to say like, oh, I really can do this. And it gets easier and it gets easier every time I do it. All right. And then the last is completion. This is the stage of mastery and satisfaction. This is when you have gone through at least every area in your home once. I'm not going to say they're going to be completely done because I'm still decluttering even after a decade because we're still bringing new things into our home. We've moved multiple times. We've, you know, we start new hobbies. We change our mind on hobbies. Our daughter grows. She needs different things. She's liking and doing different activities constantly. So there's still going to be some decluttering that happens. So the never having to to declutter again to me is not what this stage is about. This stage is about not being attached to your things, your stuff no longer having an emotional hold on you. You being able to see your things as tools to be used and things that enhance your life in a way that makes sense for you, that fits with your vision from way back at stage one. It doesn't have to be that you never have to declutter anything again, right? It's just the decluttering part is easy and you're no longer hung up on the idea of letting your things go. And so that is how we can equate this emotional cycle of change to decluttering so that we can make it a little bit easier for us. And so with that, I want to turn it to you. I would love to know what you thought about this. If it made sense when we broke it down into the ECOC, the emotional cycle of change, and which stage you related to the most. I would absolutely love to know. So come on over. If you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, you can join us over there, the Wannabe Minimalist Family Group on Facebook, and you can share with the community. There will be a discussion thread for this post, or you can DM me on Instagram, or you can comment on this post for the episode. I'm at Wannabe Clutter Free on the social channels. And as always, thank you so much for joining me here today. If you like what you hear, I hope you are subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Uh, We've got some amazing guest episodes coming up and you will not want to miss them. Definitely do not. Uh, So make sure you're subscribed. And if you really like this show, if you would take a minute to leave a rating and a review, it would make my day. I just love getting the feedback from you. So that is super helpful. And speaking of amazing guest episodes, I'm chatting next week with Ani Mikowski about quieting our inner mean girl and basically talking to ourselves in a way that is helpful and encouraging. Um, I know sometimes I can be my own worst enemy. And so next week is a really, really great episode. So make sure you tune in for that. All right, until next time, keep decluttering, keep moving forward, do not get stuck in the valley of despair, and know that I have got your back. So reach out if you need help and know that I am cheering you on. Until next time, I'm Deanna Yates, and you've been listening to Wanna Be Clutter Free. I'll see you next week. Cheers.